January the 3rd, um, but I just was so excited to see everybody that I forgot. Um, I just want to say thank you to you for being here. Um, once we were able to open our doors, many of you have been very consistent about being here and worshiping together in person. And I think that just shows how much you need it, how much I need it, how much we need to be together, to fellowship together and encourage one another, just even see one another, even if we have to be distanced apart or whatever, we just, it's just so good to see all of you. So I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful for those who watch online, um, who continue to support and encourage us here. We get notes uh, weekly from people who are watching and, and are just encouraged by, by what they're seeing. And so I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful also that you gave this last year. It would have been real easy for you not to, um, but God really blessed what you did, and we ended up um, with excess, which doesn't ever happen. It's really cool uh, to see that. So thank you for continuing to be a part and feeling connected to Little Prairie, and we're just really glad that you're here. I'm really glad that you're here today. Um, Last week we started this series called Renewal, and we're using, I'm using this scripture from Revelation 21 verse 5 as, as kind of the hub um, for what we're going to be talking about these next few weeks. Um, he who, who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. In other words, we can rely on the fact that God is making things new. Now, we, we know that things won't be completely new until we are uh, in heaven with him. That's when all of the mourning and crying and death and disease and everything is gone. There will be no Kleenexes in heaven. There won't be nursing homes and hospitals in heaven. There won't be orphanages in heaven. There will just be us with God experiencing this great new with him. But it is possible for God to continue or work new things out while we are here. I'm living proof of that. And, and so, and I think all of you who've accepted Jesus are living proof of that. How God made something new out of you. How, how you look back on your life and say, yeah, if I hadn't been for God, I'd be in a very different place right now. So God is doing new things even here, not just in heaven. And we have that to look forward to. Uh, this morning, I want, I want to focus on what it means to be remade. I, when, we, when we replace something in our home, why do we replace it? Because it's broken, right? Um, or if we want to do something new in our home, what, what I know about construction will fit on the head of the smallest nail that's been invented. Okay, I admit that. But those smarter than me tell me that if you're going to remodel something, if you're going to replace something, you've got to get rid of what's old. You've got to break down that wall. You've got to take out that beam. You've got to do something to make it new so that it, 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 it's refreshed, it's more sturdy. Um, you don't, when you remodel, you don't save old wood, right? You get new wood and put new wood in place of the old wood. That's just what we do. But we have to look at what we see, and we have to know that it needs to be replaced, that it needs, something needs to be different, that, that it's either broken or it's bad, and it needs to be replaced. When we come into this relationship with Christ, then we are, we are told the same thing. Jesus said in Luke 9.23, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their crosses daily, and follow me. Jesus had the expectation for those who wanted to follow him. He had this expectation of this, to deny self, to take a hard look at self and see, see what it is that needs to be gone. See what it is that's part of our lives that needs to be different, what needs to be replaced so that something new can be done. 
There were people following Jesus because he could heal them. There were people following Jesus because he could feed them. There were people following Jesus because it was status. And here in this passage, he challenges them to deny self to put aside any other reason why they would follow him, to deny themselves, take up their crosses daily. In other words, you have to be prepared to suffer for being a Christian and follow me to do what I do. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. Do you know what he's trying to say here? Jesus died for you. Live differently. Jesus died for you. And so you give up the way of sin because he bore those sins on the cross. Live for righteousness. Live by God's standard from now on because by his wounds we are healed. So God can make something new even out of the wreck that is our lives because of what Jesus did on the cross. It doesn't matter what you did. It's not, it, doesn't matter now, it doesn't matter what you're doing. What matters is if you're willing to give up what you're doing and give up what you did in order to follow Christ. Are you willing to give it up? Are you willing to demolish it? Because in order for something new to be made or be remade in us, we have to demolish our old habits so that we can be remade. We have to get rid of what's old. We have to get rid of the old habit. We have to get rid of the sin. We have to at least try to live the way God wants us to live because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. If we really truly appreciate what Jesus did for us on the cross, then it brings us, it should bring us to a place when we are repentant. The word repentance, we refer to it as the spiritual 180. You realize that you're going the wrong way, that what you have or what you're doing is leading you away from God, and so you come back to him. You admit that what you did was wrong, and you, and you try to do something different. And, and I think that it's to replace sinful habits with godly ones. Because it's not enough for us just to say that we're sorry for something that we did. It's important to say that we're sorry. It's important to go to God and say, I, I have sinned, I've done this, I've said that, and I, and I know that's not right with you. So we need to say we're sorry, but there also needs to be a change of behavior. It's what Peter said when he said, you know, die to your sins and live for righteousness. It's what Jesus said when he said, deny yourselves, take up your cross daily, follow me. It, it, it's really about repentance. It's really about changing the way we are so that we reflect who God is in us. I want you to turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at a long passage of Scripture. I'm not I'm going to read it all, um, but I am going to highlight several things throughout this passage. And I'd like for you to be able to follow along with me. If you're using a pew Bible, it's page 828. Okay? I'll help you find it a little bit quicker. Um, but I would like for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 17 all the way through chapter 6, verse 18. Because I think that what Paul is talking about here is repentance. I think as Paul goes through this list of things that he's going to address in these, these last three or two and a half chapters, he's addressing repentance. As he's saying to them, this is the way you are, but this is what you should be doing. This is what you used to be, so make sure you're doing this other thing, okay? So before we get into some of the details of this, I want to read, um, specifically I want to read verses 17 to 24, okay? So if you follow along with me, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 24. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Now I need to clarify something here. Here, the word Gentiles means unbelievers. Okay? He's not talking about non-Jews right now. He's talking about those who are outside of Christ, unbelievers, worldly people. 
Okay? He says, so you must no longer live as the unbelievers do in the, futil- in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. So, so they've chosen to be this way. They've chosen to ignore God. Having lost all sensitivity, he says in verse 19, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. So in other words, when Paul came to them and was preaching to them, he wouldn't allow them to stay where they were. He challenged them to a better way of living. To a, to a life that reflected their belief in who Jesus is. If it didn't matter how you and I lived, then why do we need the Bible? If it doesn't matter how you and I live, then we don't need the gospel. If it doesn't matter how you and I live, then it doesn't matter that we're gathered here today. Right? But it matters. It matters because the scripture tells us it matters. Verse 22 it says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self created to be like God with true righteousness and holiness. So he expected them to demolish their old way and their old habits. That word, he says, when you, to put off your old self means to be permanently gone, to destroy it, demolish it, get rid of it. Because it says it's being corrupted. It means it's ongoing, uh, growing more and more rotten. If you stay with your old self, if you stay with your old habits, then it will be continue to become rotten, more rotten and rottener and rottener and rottenness. Okay? It, it just, I don't even know if those are words. But that's how it grows in us to the point where it becomes putrid. I I don't know if you've ever been around anything putrid, like the smell of a dead animal that's been on the road for several days. It's gross. And yet we wouldn't let that thing hang around our necks, right? We'd get rid of it, throw it away. And And yet, we're humans. We hang on to the old sin, we hang on to the old way of thinking, we hang on to certain things, and it continues to grow more and more rotten. He says, you gotta demolish that, you gotta get rid of that, and then he says, you gotta put on a new self. You have to have a new attitude. The only way for for us to be remade, the only way for us to be new is to get rid of what's old. And then God can work and do his thing. Okay, so then that leads us into this list. So the first thing he says there in verse 25 is put off falsehood, demolish it, get rid of it, and start speaking truthfully. If you have, if you have a problem with lying, if you have a problem with being deceitful and not always telling the truth, he says stop. Stop doing it. Start telling the truth. The next thing he says there in verse 26 is control your anger. Now, I didn't strike through that. Because it's not about getting rid of anger. Anger is a God-given emotion. And if it's applied correctly, then it, it, it helps us to protect each other and ourselves. There are certain things we should be angry about. Jesus was angry when he walked through the temple and saw that they were taking away a place of prayer so they could sell their things. And so anger is a God-given thing. We just have to learn to control it. We have to make sure that it's not coming out in ways that are ungodly. A lot of times our anger is based on selfishness, how we feel about something. And we think then, we might start thinking then that that's righteous anger. But if we were really take a look at it, we might see that we're being more selfish than we are righteous. So we've got to find a way to control the anger. The next thing he says, <laughs> stop, stop sponging off of other people and work. The challenge, therefore, for those who are just taking advantage of welfare, maybe, and, and not seeking work, not trying to work, if they can work. 
Other thing he talks about is not stop tearing people down. He says there in um, verses 29 and following, he, uses, he says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. He says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of malice in verse 31. So he says, stop tearing people down. Stop talking about them. Stop, stop running them down, tearing them down. He says, instead, build one another up in verse, 21, in verse 29. So don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your, night, out of your mouths, but, but only what is helpful for building others up. In verse 32, he says, so get rid of all bitterness, demolish that, but be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And then he goes on, follow God's example. Become a fragrant sacrifice for those who are watching you. So again, this is not about just being sorry and feeling sorry for the things that we do that are wrong, but to actually do something about it to change the behavior to demolish the old way of doing things in order to be remade into God's and what God wants. He says in chapter 5, verses 3 and following, he says, get rid of, there must not even be a hint, he says, of sexual immorality. The, the word hint means that not even a whisper of it. Don't even talk about it. He goes on to say, don't joke about it. Don't do any of that. Because it's improper, he says, for God's holy people. And he goes on to say, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. So be pure. Seek purity in your life. He says in verse 8, come out of the darkness and be in the light. He says, you were once darkness, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. So you were once darkness, now you are light. So live as children of light. Stop disrespecting in the family aspect of it in verses um, 21 to chapter, chapter 5, verse 21 to chapter 6, verse 7. <laughs> it's about disrespecting. Get rid of the disrespect. And start submitting. Submit to your husbands and wives. Submit to Christ first. Treat your children the way they need to be treated. Children, start, start submitting to your parents. I see some nudging going on, but, you know, we'll talk about that later. How you work. How you, how, what you do at your job. Respecting your bosses, your bosses respecting your employees. We get rid of the disrespect and submit because that's what Jesus wants, that's what God wants. And then in the middle part of chapter 6, it says, put on the full armor of God. It says, if you really want to be remade, then you've got to dress differently. You can't hang on to the old stuff. You gotta get rid of the old clothes. You gotta, you gotta protect yourself. And the only way to protect ourselves is by putting on the full armor of God. Notice that each part of this armor protects every single part of us our heads, our hearts, the vital organs. It gives us firmness in, 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 in the shoes that we wear, the belt holds everything together, the belt of truth that holds everything together. So we put on, we take off the old self, we put on the armor of God, and then the last thing he says is pray. I love that in verse 18 of chapter 6, he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Did you catch that? Pray how often? All the time. In every occasion, in every kind of prayer request, it doesn't matter. I, you know, I had someone, a Christian, say to me one time, I don't really pray because God already knows what I'm thinking. If, if my tongue had been 10 feet long, it, it would have just rolled right out of my mouth. And at that moment, I said, you're missing out on the relationship that you have with God. I mean, you... I mean... Is that the way you communicate with your wife? 
You don't even talk because she already knows what you're thinking? Well, no. All right. So here it says, pray to God on all occasions. Every kind of prayer and intercession. Pray, pray, pray. One verse, but there's a lot packed in there. He says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. So not only in every circumstance, but to continually pray, pray, pray. So do you see it? As we went through this, did you see the repentance that, that Paul was asking for, requiring of, of his followers of this church? To say, you need to get rid of this and instead replace it with that. You get rid of this and you replace it with that. You get rid of this and you replace it with that. He always had a substitute because it really is about, it is about living for who God is and what God wants to see in us, live for his righteousness and, and his holiness. Don't hang on to stuff. Let it go. Demolish it. Let God do a new work in you. I love this version is from the New Living Translation of, of 2 Corinthians 5.17. Paul is talking to this church about what it means to be new. And he says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Remember I said God is doing new things. He's creating and making new. And it's not just for heaven, but it's for what he's doing here now in each individual person. So anybody who comes to God, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what your life was like and what it is currently. If you come to him with repentant heart, then, then God makes something new of you. Uh, the song we sang earlier, Come Ye Sinner, Poor and Needy, Weak and Wounded, Sick and Sore. Jesus ready now to save you, right? Uh, yeah, yeah that, those words. So that's Jesus wanting us to come to him. Jesus wanting us to come and to, and to just present whatever it is we have. Not to be ashamed of it, but to be repentant of it, to say, I want to be different. I want something new for myself. I want to be made new. And the only way I'm going to be made new is if I demolish this. And I really need your help to demolish this. I really need your help to just get rid of it. And then he says, the old life is gone and the new has begun. When we decide that we're going to remodel, when we decide that we're going to do something different, then we have to break away the old. We have to demolish that so that something new can happen. I love what God can do in a life. I've witnessed it in my own. I've been able, I've been privileged to witness it in other people. And, and if you're sitting there thinking, well, you know, Jesus uh, doesn't, I mean, you guys don't know what sin I've committed. No, I don't. I don't care. God knows. And he still loves you. Romans tells us that Jesus died while we were still sinners. It's not about you becoming better in order to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. All you need is repentance to say, confession to say, look, I'm ready. I want to I be new. Please make me new. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your willingness to, to come into our mess and to build something new. Thank you for your willingness to come into our, our putrid, our rotten, and to be willing to make us new. And we are blessed by your grace. Your grace gives us hope. On our own, we are still putrid. But with you, you've made us new. You've given us something new. And we're grateful. 
Lord, I pray for those who have yet to become Christians that they would see their need for you and that they wouldn't wait for you that they would bring their putrid and their rotten and, and just bring it to you, lay it down so that you can do something new in them. Lord, I also pray for those of us who are already Christians that we would do the same thing, that we would bring our rotten and our putrid and lay it to you and, and, and just, God, help us to overcome, to demolish those old ways of living and those old ways of thinking to be made new by you. Lord, we're so grateful for the power of your Holy Spirit to work in us, to to transplant our selfishness or to transplant the fruit of the Spirit in place of our selfishness. God, I pray that we would come to a place of, of brokenness before you to know that you're the God who, who loves us. You, it, what matters is how you see us. And I pray that we would see ourselves through your eyes. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.